Hello and welcome to Sportscast Jersey. Today we are joined by rugby, uh, local rugby legend, Miles Landick. I didn't actually start start going up there till I was, till I was 15, nearly 16. When we were playing, you three, have, sometimes you only had four games a season. Ben Harvey had always said to everyone, you know, um, we'll go as far as the local born players could go. And turns out that was the championship. <laughs> to play there with your mates as well, because you've got a lot of professional rugby players that don't get to play at Twickenham or certainly not with guys that they're friends with and good pals with so um, so that certainly was was a, high, a real big highlight of my rugby journey at the club and I just felt that day that I walked in a professional rugby player slash groundsman and walked out nothing really but we knew that throughout the league campaign we have to be ruthless in what we do in order to be anywhere near competing with Guernsey at the end of the season. Uh, any support would be gratefully appreciated. We had 3,000 last year. Um, hopefully we can be somewhere near that again and we have that support to, to try and get us over the line. Hello and welcome to Sportscast Jersey. Today we are joined by rugby, uh, local rugby legend, Miles Landick. Uh, how are you doing today, Miles? Yeah, good, good. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me on, mate. Good stuff, good stuff. I suppose, like I always usually do, I'll take it right back to the start. And what, what kind of is your first memories of rugby and what made you fir- first fall in love with the game? To be honest with you, I was always a, a footballer. Well, I don't know if you could call me, me a footballer, but um, <clears throat> was playing in goal for some ones. I uh, loved my football growing up. Um, and it was just so happened that obviously due to the size I was, I wasn't a, a very good outfield player, probably uh, a, a goalie at best. Uh, so I was playing in goal for some ones, then played a bit at Roselle. But throughout secondary school, you know, um, Everyone had already been on to me about getting up to the rugby club and you've got to start playing. And I didn't actually start start going up there till I was, till I was 15, nearly 16. Um, so that's when, obviously when I first got into it and I was convinced by Mark Fisher to get up to the get up to the the rugby club and I never looked back really. And I went up for the first weekend. The second weekend we were due to play a game in Guernsey and me being the, one of the biggest and heaviest, that was put straight into the front row uh, and yeah, never, never, never really looked back. And um, yeah, rugby's given me so much, to be honest. That's quite interesting because I had you and Davis on before and he said he, he was late to the game as well. And yeah, it's interesting. Who, who kind of were your coaches? Who, who kind of influenced you after you started playing? Started playing, yeah. To be honest, we had some some really good guys. We had uh, a guy called Mick Mayo, uh, Brian, uh, Taffy, Brian Williams. Um, we had uh, Nick DeBarno, Bob Shambrick. Those guys were influential in keeping me involved in the game. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we had some great times. I met some some fantastic people that I still keep in contact with today, really. And sort of rugby's all I really know. So, uh, yeah, a huge credit to them. They put so much time in, as do most of the volunteers within local sport. Um, they put a huge amount of time into myself and everyone else. And, and yeah, and, and like I said, we, we never really looked back. And then it sort of transitioned from uh, under 15s, under 16s, uh, sort of the Colts and then uh, the Colts. And then now on to the, um, to the, to what well, was to the sort of, uh, the the rugby club side. Yeah, yeah. And talk about the Colts and that sort of age group. What was the rugby like when you were growing up? What what to honest, is this? Yeah, to be honest, yeah, I think I think uh, a lot of the, the the lads that play now within the Colts and under 15, 16s, um, even potentially to under uh, under fourteens, I've got so many opportunities now. I think that when when we were playing, you three have, sometimes you only had four games a season. 
that was literally all you so you trained flat out but you never really had many games yeah. uh, now you know uh, the Colts are in an English league um, the under 15s and 16s also they're in English league structures which is huge so you know you've got definite games a lot a lot goes into it to make that happen um, but we for instance our under eight uh, when we were under 18s uh, we had five games that season and if we didn't win the cut any of cup match we went on to win with the first first side to go on and win the Hampshire Hampshire Cup at our age group um, and if you didn't get keep getting through the next round that was you done for the season unless you could pick up the odd friendly here or there you're only playing a couple of games so I think now um, you know uh, we're in a very fortunate position that a lot of our a lot of our younger age groups play off Ireland. Uh, how frustrating was that for you obviously you would have wanted to play more how frustrating was that? Yeah 100% I think um I think the guys are always keen to to uh, to train, uh, but obviously there's only a limit on that how much you can do training without any games. But uh, it just made even more so when a game did come around. It was that extra special because you'd waited so long for it. Um, so uh, so yeah, we we ended up being pretty successful, and we went on to start an under 19 side in the end because a lot of the guys stayed on Ireland, and we entered the. Um, the national cup for Colts, we end up getting to this, the, sorry, the quarter final where we played Exeter Chiefs Academy uh, out on the main pitch out here with a fantastic crowd. And we lost by about 14 points or so, which, which wasn't bad at all considering yeah. they were in a, they were a premiership Academy. So, um, and then after that, obviously everyone sort of uni separate ways and, but no, we, we had some great times within that side and with, with a lot of the guys I played with. Yeah, definitely. And then growing up a bit further, obviously played for the rugby club. And how good were those experiences and playing amongst like the likes of John Brennan and so on? Yeah, I think um, very special. Um, probably underestimating them a bit. I wish probably having now uh, now not playing anymore and uh, probably made a bit more of those those times. Um, I was very lucky to play, you know, with some great players. Um, obviously, my first season with the, with the squad was that National 3. And then we went on to do National 3, National 2 for two years, National 1, and then into the championship. Um, so we, I was very, very fortunate. Um, some, some great players, some great mentors also. We had guys like Jim Brownrigg, who was who captain Bristol, who then came to Jersey. Um, very good friend. And, you know, just having those guys to, to mentor you through. Um, and that, you know, at the time, obviously, I was only playing rugby. I went from the rugby club to play rugby at Kennebec. Ben Harvey said, I think you've got potential, so you should come back and plus start playing for the rugby club. And that's when I took on the grounds role uh, up here. Um, yeah, and I didn't realise I had that much potential. Well, it was only that Ben took me on and, um, yeah, and, and never looked back from there, really. And, and, and to have those promotions was very special with, with the guys. Yeah, I was going to say about the promotions. How how good were those few years? Just to keep on pushing forward and forward and forward. It was was the goal always the championship, or was it? Did you did you expect that kind of run? I think Ben. I think Ben Harvey had always said to everyone, you know, um, we'll go as far as the local born players could go. And turns out that was the championship. <laughs> um, I mean, the first year. My first, in my first real se season, I ended up playing at Twickenham with Jersey. Uh, that was pretty special. We had six, 7,000 people there on the day, even though it's an 80,000 seat stadium. When there's six, six to 7,000 people crammed in one area, it makes yeah. a very loud noise. Um, so to play there with your mates as well, because you've got a lot of professional rugby players that don't get to play at Twickenham or certainly not with guys that they're friends with and good pals with so um so that certainly was was a high, a real big highlight of my rugby journey at the club um so yeah I mean there's some special moments in there for sure um obviously some heartache with a fair few injuries towards the end and um but certainly you know wouldn't, wouldn't change anything for the world really was, was Twickenham probably your standout moment or probably the team standout moment as well? A hundred percent. I think um, I think we, we had the Sime Cup the week before and I think everyone was panicking because they didn't want to get injured. Uh, and then everyone made it through that. So we ended up going to Twickenham. But it was just a great day. that they chart. I think we chartered three planes going from Jersey. Um, they went there and I remember us winning when we won we were in the airport on the way back because we did a little bit of awards night when we got back to the club 
and everyone's banging on the windows at departures at Gatwick, you know, sort of cheering. They, they're they obviously very happy. And yeah, but like, like I said, very, very special moments with some really good people. Yeah, and, and you touched on before, um, also some hard moments as well. And obviously the playing career came to uh, an early stop uh, because of your injuries and how how tough when did you know that was going to be the end and how tough was that moment to be honest you are it was only when it was really the surgeon that sort of ended it for me really I think I'd done by the end of it I'd had you know five what four knee operate or five knee operations and a shoulder operation um, I snapped my clavicle did my ACL numerous numbers of times along with everything else that goes with your knee um I did three, three, I had three operations basically back to back. I did nine months worth of rehab, came back for two months and then did my knee again. And I was out for another nine months. So mentally that was incredibly tough. Um, but obviously I was very lucky to have Steph and my family and friends around me to help me through it, but I kept going through and I, and I never, I thought, you know, I'm never going to stop. I'm going to keep going, but you know, there's a limit. And, and I sort of went to the surge, went into the surgeon. I went to see a guy called Andy Williams in, in London, who's one of the best around, does a lot of premiership football players, rugby players and international athletes. And he said, you know, at the time, how much do you earn? How much do you actually earn from, from playing rugby? And obviously I was on the grounds for all of the time. I said, to be honest, you're obviously not much, you know. Um, and he's like, I'd be stopping immediately. If you want to walk, walk and be active with your family when you're older, you've got to stop because your knee is in a, in a really bad way. And I've sort of walked, and I, at the time I was in like a professional environment, or basically a professional rugby player. And I just felt that day that I walked in a professional rugby player slash groundsman and walked out nothing really um, because I'd walked in as a, as a sportsman and I walked out, I wasn't. And I think that was incredibly tough to take. But like I mentioned, you know, having, you know, Steph and family and friends there really did help me. But, I was very lucky that, you know, when you retire from sport through injury, you either go one way or the other. You go the way of actually I'm going to give it up completely and get out of the circle and try stuff new and get away from it all. Or um, you can either go uh, the way of getting involved and, and giving back and get involved in coaching. And I fell into that quite quickly, really. Um, you know, Di, the, the athletic at the time, which was the, the, the red second team, was uh, in a transitional phase with with some of the guys retiring. Uh, so I took that on and yeah, and here we are sort of, what, seven years, eight years later. Yeah, for sure. And just just going back to those those kind of months and do you remember the, like the first kind of games that you went to watch and knew that you couldn't play? And how, how tough was that watching from the sideline when you weren't coaching or before you started coaching? It really was tough because I, I, re, I was retired in February and I'd been a part of a squad all season or for such a long period of time. And then um, I still had to see out the rest of the season. So um, I was still sort of going to watch games. But then, you know, stupid stuff sort of plays on you. You know, should I be socialising with these boys? I'm not even in the squad anymore. I've retired and... All those little bits and pieces play on your mind quite a lot, um, and it and, and it really was difficult. But you know, I suppose it, it does get easier over time. We've got a couple of boys ourselves that are, that are within our Jersey RFC squad that have, got, have been through similar, and it does get easier over time. Um, but uh, it still doesn't stop you from joining in the occasional training session uh, <laughs> with yeah. the boys now because I'm able to do that. You know, so. Um, it, it, all in all, it was the right call for me to do so, but I don't think I'll ever fully not step on the field again. I end up playing a game this season, played yeah. half a game this season because uh, we were short of front row. Um, so maybe the odd odd time, but I can't do it consistently. Yeah, exactly. Um, going more into the coaching now, when did that become more of a permanent um, role, and how 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 did you? Obviously, it was new coaching when you first started. How did you? Was it a learning on the job kind of thing or how how quick did it take to get used to? Well, I, I started, I was coaching Ken, uh, Canterbury Rugby Club quite a bit uh, before whilst I was playing. Um, so I'd already started doing a bit of the coaching. So I had sort of my, the ideas that I wanted to do. Uh, and then when Di Burton was sort of stepping away, uh, he, you know, I sort of said, well, I'm, I'm happy, I'm willing to take it all on. 
Um, and he said, yeah, that, that's fantastic. And Bill, at the, who was the chairman of the club, was very supportive of that at the time. Uh, and that's how I started. And um, it was almost a bit of a rebuilding phase because when 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 the, the, the Reds went professional, obviously a lot of the semi-professional guys who were in the Red squad a lot of guys that have been here for a while. So they ended up playing for Jersey Athletic, Jersey, Jersey Reds Athletic. Um, and by that, by the time I come to take over, a lot of them are retiring, having families and can commit as much more. So we really had to re rebuild a lot from scratch, really. Um, and yeah, we, you know, we're getting to the point now where uh, we're sort of up to a level five, sort of national three standard at the moment, which I think is fantastic. You know, we've built really well. And seen a lot of young players come through so uh yeah very proud of where the team are are to date really yeah definitely how how good has it been developing this particular side and obviously it's been together for a good few years now and how 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 good has it been to see their development over the years yeah 100 percent. obviously we had the sign cup win last year in november um in guernsey and today to probably definitely one of the best sign cup wins in recent history um you know but we had, we had that and sort of shows we could, we could compete at that level. Um, but yeah, just, just seeing the guys, um, you know, transition through the Colts, then into adult rugby. And you've got the likes of you and Spencer, you and Davies, who are, to, you know, took on the, the senior side when they were a lot younger. And now they've progressed on um, to be key, key parts of the squad, really. Um, and then also you look at the other way, you've got likes like Jerry Sexton, Roy Godfrey, uh, Jack McFarlane, those guys that have sort of retired from the red side um, who have now come in. I think they're great to have around. And we spoke about before about having mentors and guys to look up to and learn from. Um, there's no better guys like those to to come in and, and do that, really. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's just touch on the move from Jersey Athletic to Rugby Club. How did that come about? The name changed the whole move away from the kind of red side, I think. How did that come about? To be honest with you, because um, both both sides sort of had uh, aspirations. I mean, we needed to go, we needed to separate to go into the English league structure. And we're at a point where we're in um, sort of a, a second 15 league or merit league. Teams with team, we travel over to teams. Teams were then refusing to travel to us. Um, so it was all quite, um, you know, we were getting short in games. For instance, last year before the Siam Cups, I think we only played about 12 games. Where you compare that to Guernsey's games, they played literally double or, or more. Yeah. And that's always going to help, isn't it? So um, I think that um, I think that the, the, the split was good. I think everyone gets on well with each other. I don't think it's a them and us scenario. I just think that, um, you know, I'm... I, fit in both camps obviously looking after you know looking after the ground side of things with the reds and then obviously the coaching with the rugby club um i think everyone it's going really well at the moment and um and the success for both um is fantastic and long may that continue yeah for sure it's really booming up there at the moment and that that just shows in the league this season obviously you storm this this league what were your kind of reflections on this season obviously one promotion how happy are you about that? And how 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 good was the season for you guys? Yeah, hundred percent. The guys put a lot of work in. I'm um, I like to shout. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I like to keep the boys on their toes. But <clears throat> to be honest with you, the commitment they put in throughout was fantastic. And you know, uh, yeah, I think a lot of the games were were probably a bit not easy. But obviously, the, the standard that we're playing at was obviously superior to a lot of the sides in that. Um, but the guys did it professionally. Did it respectfully and um, and committed throughout the whole process. And everyone was saying, "Why can't why are you that low? You shouldn't be in that league." But you know the way the structures work, you have to start somewhere. And uh, we could only start as high as we that Hampshire would let us. Um, and they did. They put us into the highest league that they physically had. Um, we could have started at County Three, but we started at Counties One um so yeah that was the highest we could go and we knew that potentially we regardless we just got to crack on with it and um and we got through the season we did it really well um and now obviously got a few few uh, more challenges coming up against some sides who are a bit stronger um why well, not oxford harlequins at the weekend we managed to notch a good win against a, a national three sides so they're playing two leagues above what we played this season so um lots of positives 
Um, but I think now the league's done. I think the goal was to get the league done and then we'll sort of try and focus on uh, the Sion Cup stuff. And um, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, for sure. And just touching on that, obviously you got that good win against a team two tiers above. How, what, what are the long-term goals for the, your team now? And where, where do you see yourselves going? How far up? To be honest with you, I, I want to start, I keep establishing a pathway between the minis and juniors at the club and the, the first 15 and make it make sure that it's um, it's doable, that they can aspire to play in the first team. And, you know, we're, we're seeing guys, you know, like Eric Switch and Anna Shan Alanko, they were they were amazing out there at the weekend and that's all through playing see, having uh, good coaches for the minis throughout the minis and juniors and then coming into our setup and and learning quickly and um and that's what we want so uh, you know again it's a it's a bit of a bit of what ben used to say back in the day really it's as far as those local lads can go and um you know already we're proving at the moment that we're sort of a level five standard which is fantastic so um, you know, if we can get to level five and be a, be a good sustainable club in, in, in level five and make sure we've got those pathways, then uh, then that, that would be that would be brilliant. Yeah, definitely. And touching on those youngsters coming through, how as the coach, how important is it to make sure kind of the older players and make the youngsters welcome? And how, how good has that been this season for you guys? I think I think maybe in the past we probably haven't put as much emphasis on making sure we've got enough young players like coming into the squad and training with us. Um, but the good thing is, is a lot of the young young lads now. I mean, you've got Tim Gray and uh, James Mitchell, who from the Reds, who coach the Colts. They're very supportive of them get playing senior rugby um, and doing it at the right time and knowing who is ready to make that step up. So we have constant conversations. But having coaches like that who are very supportive to push them into senior rugby is um, is pretty vital. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's very important. We, that's why it was just making sure we establish clear pathways for those young guys to come through. Um, and thrive at the level and we're already seeing that from those guys already I mean look at young Cam- Cameron Halliwell he's the Colts um, Colts captain plays number eight um, he managed to he's, he's played in the match day squad a couple of times and you know certainly doesn't look out of place he's really stepped up he's um, carried well he's um, held himself with, 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 with good regard so um, fair play to them and he's enjoying that environment as well. Yeah, no, and like you say, fair play because it's a big step up into adults rugby, and it's a big, it's a big change for them as well. Um, you touched on the Siam. Obviously, it's coming up um, very soon now. Um, how? Firstly, kind of goes without saying, but I'll ask it anyway. How big are these days for Jersey rugby and Jersey and the players? One hundred percent. I think it, it hurt us last year. It really did. Um, you know, losing back-to-back Siams. I mean, we won the one in November, but we obviously lost them the, the two fairly heavily. I mean, we're in the game until half time, and then you know whether that match fitness just crept in, and um, we picked up a fair few injuries, and that's not making any excuses at all. I mean, Guernsey were the better side on the day, and they deserve to win both games. Um, but but yeah, I mean, they they are huge. They are huge. I mean, look, I, I, we we certainly haven't really spoken about the Siam up until. Um, so towards the end of the season um, but we knew that throughout the league campaign we have to be ruthless in what we do in order to be anywhere near competing with Guernsey at the end of the season because it's, it's really difficult playing in a level 7 league and then going to play a level 4 side um, yeah. at the end of the season just the physicality, the pace um, and just so, so many sort of nuts and bolts of it so um, that's why we've got the stronger games now um, I, to be honest, with you, I don't really want to apply any pressure to our boys. I think that we we we, we played a level seven this year. We're full amateur side playing against the level four semi-professional side. Um, so you know, make no, no make make no bones about it. It's going to be a difficult fixture for us, but one we're really looking forward to. And you you got to give everything your all. And this year we've got the Fallets back involved again, which is sort of the the. Um, uh, the, sort of the second second team uh, a cup. Uh, we managed to we managed to get a side out with that, which is brilliant. Speaks volumes of where we're at this season, um, and hopefully we'll be looking to to be successful in both. But we're going to have to be on our game hundred uh, percent to make yeah. sure we cross the line. Uh, as a coach as well, how hard are these days to 
kind of coach with all the emotions involved as well and how to control the player's emotion? I'm pretty lucky I've got some guys around me who uh, sort of bring me back down when I'm screaming down the radio or getting frustrated at something, you know. Um, they're a voice of reason. Um, but, you know, uh, we've, we've got some great coaches, um, you know, Tom Ellis, Brendan Owen, Alex Budd, uh, coupled that with, you know, um, Rai Garcia Singh with the strength conditioning and our great medical team as well. Um, you know, we've got such a great support support network around and having those guys around to support me, as well as the senior players like Jerry, etc., cetera, um, really sort of um, helps out big time. Um, you know, emotion does come into it a lot, but sometimes you've got to pull that, pull that back and strip it down and make sure that, you know, if you're going to beat a side, you need to, you need to be prepared well. And um, you've got to have more than emotion for that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, let's touch on Strive as well, because obviously you're going to be training there. You are training there all season. How much of a game changer has that been for you guys or the rugby guys and in general sport in Jersey? Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, I, you know, I train over there as well and manage to do so, so many, you know, school kids and, um, and sports clubs using the, the great facility. I think to have an elite facility like that, I mean, you know, even when I even when I was playing first team rugby and national three, national two, and national one, we never had a facility like that ever. Never had coaches like that ever. You know, um, as in like the guys within the gym. So um, I think that I think that's a great facility. Our guys use it on a Thursday evening, um, so we they we use it before we go outside. Um, and yeah, I mean, look, England and the Lions and all 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 the, all the elite clubs that have been here so far have said it's it's an absolutely fantastic facility. So if they're if they're sharing those thoughts, then we 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 should feel pretty lucky to be able to use a facility like that. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Um, kind of finally, for people who don't know and um, aren't aware, when is the Siam and where and how can they support the team? Or the teams, I should say. So the signs on the sixth of May. Um, yeah, signs on the sixth of May. We've got four games out on the main pitch there. Really excited to see the women's squad this year. Um, uh, they they really are doing something special. Um, having seen them train, um, the development is crazy. They're doing so well. So I'm really looking forward to seeing them um, them run out and hopefully they can win again on home soil like they did last year, which was which was amazing. Um, and then we've got the veterans, which we'll probably see quite a lot of the, the older guys in there. Um, the legends, should we say. Uh, and then, yeah, the, our, our, the main game at three o'clock and then the Fallets after. So lots of rugby. Uh, and I think tickets are on the Jersey Reds website under the ticket section. Um, you can buy them there. So uh, any support would be gratefully appreciated. We had 3,000 last year. Um, hopefully we can be somewhere near that again and we have that support to, to try and get us over the line. Yeah, top man, and hopefully get the wins as well. Um, yeah. Final question, I guess, is obviously kind of going back to the injury and going into coaching. How how much would you encourage, encourage other people to stay in rugby and to go down down that route if they are unfortunate and do get injuries which stop their careers early? Yeah, I've been having a couple of conversations recently with some of the guys that have had, have had to retire and. Rugby is a, very, is a sport in general is very special. And I think some of the memories you create and the people you meet, um, I'd certainly encourage anyone to, to try and stay within their sport if they've had to retire or if they're thinking about getting to the sport. Um, the friendships you, you may you build and uh, the people you meet and the, 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 time, the good times you have. We've had, some, <laughs> we've had some great times and some great wins and, um, you know, you're sort of happy with the wins, but not so happy with the losses, but that's sport. And um, I just don't think you can, you can really beat it. So one thing I'm looking forward to after the rugby season is getting back on the cricket field again. I love my cricket, so I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, a few, few important weeks for us to, to, to get over the line and, uh, and then the guys have, will have a well-earned rest. Brilliant. Thank you for coming on today, Myra. It's no, been thank great you so much, mate, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Cheers, mate. Thank you so much. Uh, that was another episode of Sportscast Jersey. Uh, another episode is coming soon.